Okay, so welcome everybody. This is our last seminar for this semester in the, in the Biostats uh, Division Seminar Series. And uh, it's a real privilege to have uh, Ed uh, Iverson here from uh, Duke University. He's in the Department of Statistical Sciences at Duke. And talking to Ed for a few minutes, I realize there's kind of connections he's got to various folks in, uh, in our division or associated with our division. Um, <coughs> so I'll uh, tell you a little bit about Ed and then maybe a little bit about some of those connections. But So he, he um, uh, spends his time really at the interface of statistics and genetics, and so um, that's why it's nice to see some of the folks from the HIG here, and I guess some more on their way. Um, his sort of statistical areas of interest are in uh, Bayes methods for cancer risk assessment. Uh, he's looking at uh, gene by environment and gene by gene interactions. Uh, he's looking at models for SNP data, including uh, Bayesian GWAS studies, uh, statistical inference regarding uh, cancer risk uh, using high risk family data. Um, so he's, he's actually spent some time along those lines looking at things like uh, BRCA1 and 2 gene characterization, characterization and uh, risk modeling. Um, and in terms of his background, this is where some of those overlap areas happen. So he, he got his undergraduate degree at uh, the University of Chicago uh, in mathematics and then did his master's there under Michael Stein. Uh, then he moved to Yale University where he has some overlap with uh, Hammond, uh, I guess they were years apart, and he worked with John Hardigan there at, uh, at Yale. Um, he then moved, he um, spent a little bit of time in it before he settled down at uh, Duke University, uh, where he was an assistant professor from 2000 to 2006, uh, and then migrated on um, to an associate professor and now what's called the uh, Department of Statistical Sciences. It had various names um, before that. So uh, Ed's going to talk to us today about something titled yeah. In Focus. Okay. There we go, Functional Annotation Center. Okay. There we go. Functional oh, yeah. annotation signatures is prior information in GWAS. So welcome. Yeah. So um, thank you. So, yeah. The basic idea. I mean, you're, you're I'm sure mostly familiar with what a genome-wide association study is, and uh, been involved with a number of those, uh, primarily in ovarian cancer. With, with uh, uh, Russian doll sort of uh, progression of, of studies that began with Canada Gene, individual case control study based uh, analyses that expanded to multi study, multi investigator GWAS to multi GWAS. Um, so things are getting ever more complex, but the, um, the running theme has usually been let's look at the genetic data uh, and use that. You know, use the genetic data to, to determine association, and then we'll try to figure out what's going on at at, at the side that pop up uh, um, after the fact. So um, I'll give a very brief background to association studies, probably unneeded here. Uh, talk about the kinds of additional data that we might involve in an association study, uh, namely functional annotation data, um, and. Uh, We'll then talk about models we might use for association study or association testing that can uh, involve those those data. Uh, part of the analysis, the the, the, the approach is to take a, 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 a make, construct a two-stage model. Uh, one of the stages involves uh, characterizing uh, essentially signatures of association that are based on the function data, so linear combinations of, of functional annotation variables that. May uh, that, that indicate a, uh, a SNP or a variant is, is, is more likely to be associated than, than not. Um, and so I'll talk uh, for a bit of time about the analysis we did to build a prior distribution on the, on the, uh, the parameters that would be used in that second stage of the, of the modeling. And then give you an example uh, using data that we've been looking at for a while now in ovarian cancer. And then wrap things up after that. So, uh, as you probably know, the uh, genome-wide association studies aim to uh, identify or characterize the uh, association between common, typically common variation, uh, inherited variation in, in the genome, and a phenotype of interest, or sometimes multiple phenotypes. Uh, when the, you know, the ultimate downstream goal is to try to find uh, a 
region that has some kind of biological function that, that can be tied, tied to the disease, and if, if the phenotype is a disease. And uh, perhaps that, uh, with the hope that that information could be used in treatment or understanding the biology and, and helping us to sort of decode what's going on with the disease. But the ultimate goal is to really get it function. Um, you know, a more proximal goal with, with genome-wide association studies is, is sort of what you might get out of a, a standard epi experiment, which is, trying, is, is to you know, identify factors that might indicate somebody is, has a higher predisposition to disease. And you know, risk, risk modeling is, is a useful endeavor. Uh, however, with ovarian cancer, it's a little, a little problematic. And, so I said at another time, but um, you know the more distant and probably more fundamental interest in a lot of the, this work is, is is getting at the biology. So the functional data is very important. It, it actually it, it, the association analysis, the genetic data, give you give you an, uh, give you sort of the empirical evidence to, to point you in a, in a particular region. The function data basically tells you what's going on there, helps you to interpret it, and provides buttressing information for for um, the variants that appear to be associated with region. And, uh, and the sort of, you know, behind all of this, is uh, the, one thing that makes this, this problem uh, particularly interesting and plays an important role in this is that, it is, is that we're looking at huge numbers of variants across the genome. And these things, uh, it, from a statistical point of view, these things are, are, are correlated. So if we look at, at, at markers, uh, the typical Genome-wide association study might start with a uh, an assay that has a certain number, 500,000, a million, two and a half million markers on it, genetic markers that are meant to capture variation across the genome. Well, there are far more variants or common genetic variants that are, that are positioned on those those chips, uh, and the, what allows you to get a, get away with that is that the we tend when when a we inherit a variant, we tend to inherit the genetic real estate on either side of that variant. So we get correlation. And that correlation is what's referred to as uh, linkage to equilibrium. So when we, uh, do, we conduct, conduct an, uh, an association analysis on a particular variant, what we're doing is looking at whether or not essentially that, you know, the, the, re the region around that variant is associated. Or the evidence, it's just a way of assessing evidence that, 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 um, that genotypes that are defined by the, the genome in that, that region are associated. And it's linkage to equilibrium and the correlation structure is something we can make use of to, to reduce costs uh, in terms of, of, of initial genotyping. So we can actually get away with a, a one-chip assay that will give you a pretty good picture of what's going on across the genome. The disadvantage is that you know, you, you, you've lost some information in, in, um, on, regarding the variants that were not positioned on that chip. And some, some of these variants are not well characterized by the, 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 the so-called tags that are on those, those chips. But the correlation structure also leads to uncertainty about where an association resides when you, when you actually see something. So when you conduct the association test, it's common to, to plot uh, a measure of association at the position of the, of the variant and do this across the genome. These things are called Manhattan plots. And what you'll see in areas of interest is that there will be a, a peak, and then it'll, and th things will go down to noise, and then a peak. And you'll, and if you zoom in on those peaks, you'll find mul multiple variants that are correlated with one another in a region that that are that are pointing to, to an area of interest. The association, it turns out, is unlikely to be one of the things that you've you've actually genotyped, and more likely to be something in between. So we have uncertainty. Uh, we need we you know, we start with the genetic. Uh, a standard genetic and, uh, data analysis, we end up with a region of interest, and that's basically the discovery phase. And the more interesting and, and uh, more important phase is, is, is actually characterizing and uh, localizing that association from a, you know, a region, part of a chromosomal arm, down to a particular variant, and understanding what gene function that, that variant might be uh, interrupting. So we can fill in the gaps using uh, additional genotyping, or because we have a pretty, pretty good handle on correlation structure, you can do imputation to fill in some of these snips. There are always gaps, and there's always uncertainty, and uh, it really helps to go past the genetic data to understand what, uh, to gain additional information about what, what's going on at a particular level. So functional data helps you there. But um, the 
functional data is typically not employed at, at, at the initial stage of, of discovery. It's often sort of uh, at, a, at a characterization or localization stage. And I'll go into that and give you an example in just a minute. The functional annotation, annotation data is basically uh, data that's collected, typically genome-wide, but not always, that um, allow, uh, that, that provides information on the role a particular region uh, or se uh, sequence in the, in the genome plays in, in, in <coughs> regulating biological functions. There are multiple different assays and multiple different functions of these, these uh, forms of data uh, are interrogate. Uh, some of them are dependent upon context. So we have the same machinery in, in, in most of our cells, but it's not always used in the same way. So it, some of these um, functional data points or variables are tissue dependent or cell, cell type dependent. An example are, are variants that, that, affect, uh, that are tied to expression of a particular gene that, that is either expressed solely or uh, often in that particular cell type, but not in another cell type. These are EQTLs, but there are other forms of, of annotation data that get at uh, regions that are likely to harbor transcription factors and binding sites and other active areas of regulation in the genome that, that are tied to the specific context. We have context-specific data, and we have uh, data that's independent of context. Basically, those, those, those variables are, are tied to location. and. For example, the you know whether a SNP is in uh, or the variant is in a coding region of a gene, whether it's likely if it's whether it's known to be amino acid changing, it is always amino acid changing. It's always in the gene in all cell types, the, uh, and, and that's basically uh, the type of annotation that would apply in, in, in a variety of contexts. The um, these context independent variables are they're they're. they're one issue with these data is actually assembling them and collecting them, and there are a number of great resources on the web that allow you to do this now. In terms of just harboring the largest collection of useful variables, you find the genome browser, the University of Santa Cruz genome browser to UCSD. The genome browser's guide. Just about a, a track for, for, for most, if not all, of the, the data types and, and the um, locational uh, data points are, are, you know, the data types are, are easily available there. The ENCO project uh, has deposited their data there, uh, recently released a huge amount of, of data. Uh, they took up a, a full issue of Nature, a full issue of Genome Biology in September with something like 30, 30 papers describing the data that they've collected. With the, you know, with, with the the goal of providing what they call an encyclopedia of DNA elements. It's basically a roadmap to the regulatory framework in the genome, uh, so that we can, you know, if you're presented with a, a variant in a particular lo location in the genome, you can uh, look this data up and get a sense for what it might be involved with, what it might be doing, what its significance might be. And that's the whole point of, of, of annotation, is to, to provide that additional bit of data. So this is a, a, a plot I, I pilfered from one of the uh, the ENCODE publications that, that gives a nice graphic about what the annotation data is about. It's basically about um, getting at, at things that you, you don't see when you're looking at, at, at sequence necessarily. And, and the, the pictures range from uh, looking at locational kinds of, of um, variables like whether you know, the, the gene context you're in, if, if the, the variant is in or near a gene, uh, to larger scale uh, regulatory kinds of, of um, elements and where they might uh, bind and, and, and their relationship to, to gene expression, and then to, to larger scale uh, variables to get at the architecture of the, of the, uh, the genome as, it's, as, it's, um, uh, as it occurs in the cell, basically looking for Regions that are more likely to be open and expressed in a particular cell type, and um, and, and 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 it basically gives you a picture of where, where the transcriptional machinery might be taking place, and it, it suggests that an area might be of interest for, for functional region uh, for functional reasons. It helps you to localize an effect, and if you find yourself in that in that part of real estate. 
Do, 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 do one of those pistons correspond to the beads on a string with the optomeres? Is that the idea? So, we, this, so these are so this is a chromosome. Uh, it, the the DNA is wrapped around uh, these. Uh, uh, these are the. Um, blah, 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 blah. These are nucleosomes. They're they're wrapped around these these histone histone. I guess they're just histones. Are those, uh, but they're, those, those what are those what people call optomeres? I'm not sure. But they get a it, the. Accessibility of DNA to transcription is an important thing that, that, that they're asking yeah. for. And, and when uh, the DNA is bound around a, a histone element, it's it's less accessible to transcription. So there are modifications to the, the histones that, that, that can affect whether something's in or not. And there are gaps where, where DNA is more accessible for transcription that are presumably more likely. Those are often context or cell type specific variables. Um, I am not a, an expert in in all of these assays, I'm trying to get my, uh, wrap my head around these 30 papers that just appeared last September. Um, but th I think the point is that we've got, there's a lot more to a genetic association study than, you know, a SNP appears at you know, base pair 2,345 on chromosome 11. Uh, we need to take into account context, and there's a, a lot, a lot that can be learned from context. And the question is, how do you make use of that data, and when do you make use of that data? And so order, order of incorporating data is, is pretty important. Um, so I, I, I tend to work in a, in a, in a, in a with cancer examples we, in, in case control data. So we are most frequently looking at a binary phenotype or a disease. Um, but disease can be a general phenotype, and, and uh, you could be analyzing data from a, a cohort study or some other form of, of a study. But the, the basic, basic um, framework, I think, is, based, is, is the same here. We, we ultimately want to know whether a particular variant is associated or not, and I use the letter A or variable A to indicate yes or no uh, association status for a particular variant. We have data on uh, disease phenotype for an individual. We have uh, function data that are associated with the variant, and ultimately our goal is to, to, to uh, estimate as a Bayesian the posterior probability uh, that the variant is associated, given the um, the data that you have from from the association study and the functional data, the question is how do you put those the, the functional data and the and the association data together? The more formal and obvious way to a Bayesian is is by introducing uh, a hierarchical model, and um, in one at one incarnation of the model, you might treat the uh, function data is prior information on association, and do an external analysis, for example, that might might help you to understand the relationship between functional variables and association status, assuming you have some training data to do that with, uh, and then build that into the results of, a, of an association study, which would be what you get here, the probability, the, basically the likelihood component here would be the the likelihood of disease given phenotype and association status. Um, this sort of approach is infrequently used. In fact, the only um, formal application I, I'm aware of is by this group who, who advocated for a, a two-stage hierarchical, hierarchical model, basically done in the, uh, built in the free, frequentist domain. Uh, one major difference, they were um, the model, hierarchical modeling was on the coefficients in a, a regression, so they were fitting a prospective regression of disease, a regression of, logistic regression of disease status on a set of variants. The variants each had coefficients, and there was a regression of the coefficients on functional data. Sort of this framework, not quite. Uh, it worked for candidate gene studies and small numbers of SNPs. It doesn't scale, um, because there's a limit to the, the size of, of uh, prospective models you can fit are approaches that I'm sure you're aware of and are probably working on that, that will help you get past that. Discuss those. Um, but that's where we stand now with with with, with this approach. Uh, not not used much. The more common way to, to incorporate function data is post hoc. And I say roughly, and I mean very roughly, what what people do is they take their genetic data and they, they um, actually I think I'm missing here, but uh, the D actually should be hiding over here. 
So they do an association scan and come up with a measure of, asso uh, of association based purely on the, 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 the genetic and phenotype data, uh, which would be akin to this posterior probability of association given G and D. And they say, well, let's, let's look at the, the top hits or the, the, the few interesting loci that we, we find. And given that, we'll assess the weight of evidence of the functional data in light of what we're seeing in terms of association. That's kind of this piece here. It's done in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, not formally, but presumably it could be made formal. But I'd like to argue for, for doing things this way uh, and involving the function data at the discovery stage as opposed to what's most, more commonly done at a, at a characterization or a localization stage. And I'm sure you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> and read all those others. This is an example of post you know, a, a functional, uh, the results of a functional analysis of a uh, ovarian cancer locus that popped up as part of one of the GWAS analyses that we've been doing. Um, and we as in we. <laughs> um, what they, they tend to do is they, they hone in on a, an area of the genome. This is, this is from the, you know, the browser. And here you've got a, a you know, chromosomal map. You focus in on the chromosomal region, you identify genes, identify the variants, the SNPs that are there, the landmarks, and, um, and then you can add in information on that, that relate to function. So, um, you know, this, this, these sort of vague peaks here um, are ENCODE data, the early ENCODE super tracks that get, that, that get at um, various uh, various of the assays. So there's chip seek data, there's DNA hypersensitivity data. These peaks are, are areas that they think are more interesting than others. There's not, a, you know, the, the, the form of these data is, is, is actually something to, to, you need to think about. It's, it's, it's not clear this is a such and such a regulatory region. It's uh, a step back from that. These, these are assay data. There's a high, you know, the, the, that, uh, and when this assay is high, it suggests you know, this, this might have this particular so we've got these these data, and um, and then and that's basically data that's not context specific. That's data that was um, annotated across, in this case, seven cell lines. Other of these use multiple cell lines, but they're different cell types, and they're averaging over context, averaging over the the um, the cell type that might be relevant to the phenotype you're looking at. This is ovarian cancer association data. There's no ovarian surface epithelium cells in, in, that, in that data, or no fallopian epithelial cells in that data. If you want that kind of information, if you want, you, know, you have to collect it. So that's what our collaborators did here with uh, some fair seek data um, on those two cell types that I just mentioned. And then they've uh, added some other information here. Point being that, that um, they just Reasonably well organized. If you've got your own data, you can add it in. But there are basically two types of data: data that that are get at general patterns across cell types, and, and those that then may be specific to the to the cell type of interest. When you're looking at a phenotype, it may not be clear what that cell that cell type is. And I, I think there's there's a lot of work and thinking to be done to, to actually get all of this modeling right. But uh, we've got to start somewhere. Obstacles to genome-wide uh, application of the, the kinds of two-stage methods I'm talking about are obviously obvious in terms of scalability. Um, whatever analytic technique you, you need to do, it's got to be able to handle a large number of variants. And as time passes, we're, uh, impu we're, we're genotyping using denser products, genotyping project products, and we're imputing to um, a larger number of SNPs. And it's not like sticking it into SAS and running over two-stage progression. You can't do that. Um, so we need to, to build relatively simple models that make heavy use of conditional independence assumptions, things that we can scale, um, or find penalized progression techniques that might allow you to admit prior data by our, by our hierarchical extension. Um, question marks there, don't know if they exist. I know that the, the NEG prior has been used for, um, for, for analysis of genome-wide data prospective model that's a technique called H lasso Hobart et al. So there are people doing this. Uh, they don't have the, you know, you can't plug in prior data and you can't do updating, but they're starting to go in the direction of fitting large prospective models. I'm sure other people are as well. 
the next uh, obstacle is amassing the, the relevant data that you that, that you want to, to function data to, to, to annotate the, the variance that you're looking at. Uh, and a genome-wide scale, that means you're um, amassing a huge amount of data. So in the one example I show, we've got 2.5 million SNPs. And we've got to annotate each one. And in the next stage of what we're doing, we've, we've imputed to the 1,000 genomes, and we've got about 20 million. You know, so what we do is got to got to scale, and we've also got to be able to, to, to pull the relevant information at that, that, that level of aggregation. And for some of these, these um, assays, it's fairly straightforward. Some of these assays pertain, pertain to smallish regions, 500 KB regions. So if you know the, I mean, you can basically annotate a single base pair, you're, you're fine. Other things are a little bit harder to, to, to do at that scale. And, and actually putting it all together in a file and analyzing it is another issue altogether. Um, the other problem that I alluded to in the previous, in the, that, uh, the, the figure, the previous figure, was that it, it's not always obvious what the relevant annotation data might be. I mean, you, you might start with some uh, some of the ENCODE data that's averaging across cell types, but you may want to, to be a little bit more specific to the, the phenotype of interest. You sometimes you've got to think about that, and, and it, even if you know, it often uh, re requires a great deal of expense and time to, to actually collect those in the, in the right uh, and this is the right cell type. So the assays that um, that were done for ovarian cancer uh, were custom and they were labor intensive and expensive and time consuming. And I think they were just focused on specific areas, not across the, the genome. But you know, getting this, these data together is not easy. If you think about it. So when it comes time to to do an analysis that involves function data on a particular problem, you want to involve people who understand the, the phenotype and can, can help you to, to th think about the, the data that you might want to incorporate. So domain expertise is important. Modeling is also important. As um, The ENCODE data that I worked with was from one of their pilot projects, fairly straightforward. Um, the ENCODE data that was just released is much more complex. There are certainly, you know, if you start going through the papers that they released in, the, in, in September, you can see that the, there's a, quite a bit of complexity there that you need to understand before you pick that up and, and start working with it. So modeling is going to be important, and somebody to help you with the modeling, pointing in the right direction is going to be important. Yeah? What, what is functional versus function versus any other kind of data? What, what, is, what is the adjective function or functional mean when it applies to data? Okay. Yeah, I mean, these are the annotation variables that will relate a specific genetic variant to experimental or contextual data that suggests a biochemical, biological function to that region of the genome. That functional is not. Sorry. Yeah, yeah not functional. <laughs> I was wrong. Yes. So this is that. like your slide before <laughs> yeah. where you had yes. um, tissue dependent yeah. and tissue independent. Yes. 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 Yeah. So we, we basically have two sorts of data here, and, and um, I'm going to try to make the, the distinction clear because the modeling that we do tends to be uh, two-staged. You, you entertain one sort of data first, and then you go to the second form of data. The first form of data tends to be the, the genetic association data, the empirical evidence of there's an association around here between here as in, in the genome at a lo locus near this variant that is associated with the phenotype of interest. And that's purely the associated data. Purely, um, it's free of any information you might have about where that variant is and what it might be affecting if it's changed. I mean, if there's variation of that variant, does it change an important function? That's a critical question because the, when you see an association, presumably something's happening. I mean, you, you can't make the, the, the um, you know, causal connection between a variant and, and disease very easily. But what you can do is put together a lot of circumstantial evidence that suggests that there's a smaller, smallish number of variants at this particular region that looks interesting from our genetic association data that have you know, a putative functional characteristics that might make it worth following those variants up in terms of specific experiments that can test for function. Once you, you get yourself down to an, a handful of variants, there are some assays that you can do to check whether variation at that particular locus affects the function in a particular context. 
So the function data is is so so vibrating on the sort of which wallet tools are going where and doing what is that? Yeah, uh, they're even sort of yeah. It's a specific, I mean, essentially yes. I mean, there are a number of different you know. It's basically a lot of it's guilt by association. <laughs> you know, so so there are you, know, you look at there are these assays that look at various they're, they're designed to do various uh, things. And I, like I said, I don't understand the, 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 the details of the, the assays well enough to describe them, but there are, are some that will search for particular binding motifs, which are basically you know, a, a, a length of, of base pairs that, that have particular characteristics of it. And they have assays that will run around looking for these things. And there'll be evidence, you know, you'll get assay evidence back that, that a motif occurs in this particular region. And that's, that's annotation data. Knowing, you know, knowing that this variant falls within uh, an exon of a protein coding gene, that's annotation data, it's context. Going past knowing that it's, you, know, you have a SNP and its location is this on a chromosome, doing anything more, adding any other context to it that might help you to understand what that variation might mean for the organism is functional annotation data. In my definition, of that. a formal definition, but and I use function, functional, I'm sloppy with words on slides. And uh, there's no functional data analysis in this, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so you can leave now. <laughs> so, so, it's, okay, so it's, it's the way the organism actually functions that's yeah. meant. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're just trying to, so, so you, you'll, you'll see, you know, if you look at these data, you'll see all kinds of, of you know, so-called hits. Because of the correlation structure, you know, if you, I, I wish I included one of these slides, but, you know, in one of the, we've got these, regions where we've initially detected an association mean, do additional genotyping, and then plot the association data. And you see these raft of like tens, twenty, thirty, a hundred SNPs with likelihood ratios that are within you know less of an order of magnitude or something. You don't know which one of them is, is likely to be so the, the true variant. And you can't follow up each one of those with experimentation. But if you have readily available annotation data, you can do what that group did there and they, they start to look at context and say, well, this read, you know, this looks more interesting, and they're doing that post hoc, but they're just sort of adding window dressing, and this, you know, this, these, these variants over here really, you know, they're correlated with some interesting things, but the interesting things are over here. Those also have high you know, uh, association evidence, but, but we also have functional data. And so you know, it's basically combining the two forms of data, the, the sort of gold standard association data, yes, this is killing people, uh, versus the, you know, or there's evidence that something in this region is, is, is causing disease. And um, and the information on what those various, various variants do. And if you've got something that says this is likely to be a protein changing variant in a key gene, you know, a lot of people stop there. But the, you know, this functional annotation data is not always that crystal clear. And um, but it is available and I'm arguing. So this is almost the same as the slide before. I think I added you know, X is in for covariance you might have in the model, and trying to lay out some of the conditional independence assumptions you might do to, to scale this up. So what's typically done in GWAS studies, especially when you're analyzing 2.5 million, 10 million variants, is to, 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 to do variant at a time analyses. And yes, variants close by are highly correlated with one another, but we ignore that or we make some conditional independence assumptions that brush under the table. Um, and it tends to work reasonably well. So what, what I'm arguing here is, is, is for uh, an, a model of conditional independence where we look at, at a variant at a time and um, just arguing that the association status of a specific variant is conditionally independent given the uh, association data and, and the, the, the functional data uh, on, on the, of the conditionally independent of the others. Um, you know, that the various AIs are conditionally independent of one another is given, given these data, and that the AIs are um, conditionally independent of the uh, functional and genetic data on the other variants, conditional on their own data. Questionable, maybe, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's a starting point. Um, like I say, there are, some multi, there are ways of relaxing these assumptions that, that have some traction, um, and you know, taking this as a starting point. So, all this slide basically depicts is that factorization I gave you earlier that if we view the, the function data is uh, prior data 
So we're doing this, instead of having function data post hoc, we start with uh, an analysis that gives us some data on phenotype association given functional data. We take that as prior data. The posterior odds of association, when we incorporate the genetic, or the, you know, the genetic data, the association data, is the likelihood ratio from the association analysis times the prior odds from the functional analysis. And now we're involving the functional data analysis in the discovery phase. And the point here is that with a little extra added resolution you get from this part of the model, you can start to push genes further, or SNPs further up. You can improve your, your inferences at an earlier stage of the analysis, which is important, because you can typically only follow up in additional samples of a small number, a relatively small fraction of your SNPs. And the more you can push up, the higher, the better off you are. So giving the hope is that these, these functional data will give you a boost, make the, the study more efficient, and give you a higher yield. So the modeling is, is really straightforward. Um, we, we essentially calculate uh, marginal or SNP at a time base factors of association that are adjusted for whatever we think is important to adjust for using software that's described in Melanie's uh, uh, MISA paper, uh, available there or available from me. Um, but there are also there are also other software packages that will give you base factors. Um, we're basically doing Bayesian analyses. That's a Bayesian integrated likelihood ratio. And that fits into the, the, the picture or the slide on this page. So we've got uh, machinery to calculate that. We calculate that anyway. And we would typically just stop the analysis here, look at our variance, and pass on the top ones to, to a, a second phase of, of uh, validation. Here I'm arguing we add the prior odds of this association in, and we can do this using a binary model. And you can write an expression for the posterior probability of association involves. Uh, the association data and the function data, given you have uh, an alpha and a beta. So the parameters that you need to worry about forming the parameters of this, this model, of course. Um, and that's what I'll talk about next. After this. So we can, if you want to use that, you know, if you want to use that framework for inference, you can either do a discount analysis, basically plug in, if you have plug-in estimates for the alpha and the beta, you can uh, readily update your, your probabilities with association using the functional data, by plugging in a posterior mean of, of the, the two parameters that, that appear in the prior model. Or you can update uh, the, the data using, uh, update those parameters, the alpha and the beta, using uh, the standard Bayesian machinery. Um, and I'm in the process of comparing that to this on the, on the ovarian cancer data, there's reason to be um, I don't think you're going to get very far with this uh, because in most cases you have a relatively small number of truly associated loci for a particular disease. So you're not going to gain a huge amount of new information unless there's a lot of sort of just under the um, under the horizon associations that are that are there and weak, but but enough to, to give you some give you some additional power. But in terms of strong uh, associations with common variants. Not seeing that many. Ovarian cancer 11, breast cancer in the order on the order of 30s, prostate cancer is one of the better with 70 or so, uh, but they're not that many. So you're doing a regression on two and a half million variants with with maybe 50, 60, 70 true associations, and of course they're not known for sure, and and millions of zeros. So it's a, you know, a, a, a logistic regression with very few successes. Uh, so we can update that using a, a in standard machinery. To do either one of these, we need in, in, uh, informative data on the A and the, or the alpha and the beta. And what we did to get there was to develop, uh, to essentially design a case control study of um, data available on the web. So the, NC, uh, the national uh, NIH has got a, a GWAS catalog, list of associated variants across phenotypes, some information about the location and, and the phenotype. Involved, so forth and so forth. At, at some point, we downloaded that and took um, the associated SNPs as cases, found match controls, conducted a case control analysis of SNPs. Um, and there's some details of this I don't know that you want to listen to given the rapidly advancing time. But um, we tried to be careful in our 
when we were doing this um, to avoid uh, biases. Uh, a lot of the variants that were especially identified early on were, were um, found using uh, assays that were uh, sort of biased in their coverage of certain functional classes. And, um, and so looking at the um, you know, SNPs SNP from those products as, as, as cases in a sort of population-based kind of analysis doesn't, doesn't make sense. The idea is to treat the SNPs as exchangeable members of a, of a population, and we're trying to you know, find risk of the phenotype association. Given the, um, the functional data, we need to have representative cases from our population, representative controls. And so we jumped over a couple of hurdles to create a sampling frame. We subset it to SNPs that were identified using common tagging platforms and uh, did, did that kind of thing. Um, details I'm happy to provide. Because of this LD problem, we know that, that, that associated SNPs are almost invariably not the truly associated SNPs. So we have to look, you know, we, if we're going to associate function data with a particular case SNP, we need to look at all of its, its partners. And so we use, a, I think, turning out to be a fairly common definition of LD partners or neighbors or correlated SNPs, which is to take SNPs that are, that are uh, correlated with your case SNP and your control SNP uh, to an R squared or squared correlation of 8. And there have been other analyses that suggest that that works pretty well. Um, so we did that. Um, we matched controls. Uh, and we excluded some you know, SNPs as controls if they, they got too close to a, a case. Then we annotated all of those, those variants. Uh, there were 50,000 of them or so. And we, we took sort of these, these invariant, uh, cell type invariant measures of uh, DB SNP function class that tells you whether a variant is in, in a gene zentron, exon, whether it's uh, protein changing or not, et cetera. Um, and some other context specific data that were available to us. Uh, there was a paper that came out a couple years ago when we were doing this, starting to do this, uh, that suggested that uh, these, these variants called expression quantitative trait loci derived from lymphoblastoid cell lines were useful in, um, in, in characterizing function of, of uh, across phenotypes. So they were looking at the GWAS catalog as well. Um, so we, we incorporated that data. Um, some evolutionary conservation data, data about known uh, common uh, variants, uh, not SNPs, but indels, copy number variants, and inversions. And then the SuperTrack data from the Inco pilot project. There were several different types, a lot of cell lines. We combined those data, and basically, since we're starting to look at a large number of variables in a, in a relatively small regression, uh, we're about uh, data reduction. So we, uh, we, we took these various data types and looked at the principal components of the, the summaries that we were using, reduced them to, to those describing like 95% variation in those variables, and put those in the model. Um, and there's a couple of other other types of, of variables in there as well. Um, so that gives us a, uh, a data set to work with, a matched case control study. We took uh, about a quarter, was a quarter or a fifth of the uh, fifth of the variants out to, for validation. So we built several models using the training set, and then looked at how they did in the in the, in the validation set. Um, and since we, we were basically combining blocks of, of data that were centered on, on cases and controls, we needed we ad adapted the binary likelihood for, for having case blocks and control blocks. And we assumed that, that control blocks had no associated variants in them. And they contributed this to the likelihood. And the case blocks contained one or more associated variants. And they contributed this to the, to the, um, the likelihood under independence. handled that, that sort of two-stage two design of the, the case control study that way. Um, the intercept was basically determined by the design of the, the study. Um, we assumed that we, we didn't expect to find more than 30% of the case blocks with the, the second or third variant. Um, and we also expected that a fraction of those 54 variables to be meaningful or useful in, in terms of, of prediction. So we um, used a shrinkage prior on the the uh, coefficients in this regression. We decided on using uh, a neg distribution. 
uh, we decided on doing that as opposed to using Bayesian model averaging as for a model choice uh, algorithm because of the dimensionality of 54 and the non-standard nature of the likelihood that we were working with, but uh, certainly that's a direction to go in. And in fact, this will suggest another uh, similar model selection uh, algorithm that we did not follow up on. So the next, whenever you have a prior distribution, you've got hyperparameters to worry about, and, and we, we chose chose three different prior uh, or specifications of the neg prior, all independent on the coefficients, independent univariate neg distributions on the coefficients are two uh, parameters for the neg distribution. By tweaking them, you can basically uh, control the, um, the scale of influence of the prior distribution. So if you're doing, um, it's a really neat distribution, but if you're, if you're doing uh, model selection uh, and by a maximum a posteriori estimation, the, um, if you're within this, this range, the uh, MLE is basically shrunk to zero. Outside of that range, it rapidly recovers to uh, the MLE. So the shrinkage is, is basically confined to this region that you can define. So we done, if we, in, in, in this, what follows, if we had used map estimation, we would have been basically removing instead of shrinking a lot of the coefficients. We did MCMC and we end up with all of the coefficients in the model, but a lot of them are, are, are shrunk. You can go both ways. Um, but that describes the, the algorithm we use to, to describe a progression of models or decide on a progression of models, and that's, that's what we did. It turns out we should have looked at a wider range of things. We also fit a normal, independent normal prior as uh, comparison. We used MCMC, did a lot of chains, looked at uh, diagnostics, and everything went great. And here's one of these wonderful plots you cannot see. Um, but it, it demonstrates the, how the shrinkage depends upon the uh, degree uh, of, the, of this, the hyperparameters here you've chosen. And the more extreme versions of the neg distribution are uh, shrinking more. Uh, for a lot of these variants where there, there appears to be a lot of these variants, a lot of these uh, functional and patient variables where there appears to be signal, there's not much shrinkage. Where there is a lot of uncertainty, you can see, you know, the the, 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 the shrinkage is, part, is, is very significant. The normal models got a posterior standard uh, deviation of that magnitude. The first neg, the second neg, the third neg. So you're you're shrinking things away. If we'd done map estimation, that you know those, those variants would very likely have disappeared. Um, instead, they're they're contained in the model. But it, it's it's interesting to see what's going on there. Uh, but when you look at what happened, it's maybe not, not worth dwelling on too much. Uh, we then carried the various, under the various models, made our predictions of the, un, of the validation set, the, the case control blocks that we did not involve in the analysis, and uh, produced RSE curves and, and um, concordance statistics. And the, you can see you, you do a little bit better the more you shrink. And you've got an out of sample. Uh, Gordon's index of, uh, or area under the curve of 0.598 for, for the normal model, it in incrementally increases onto the first neg to 6.602, 605, 606. You're doing better with more shrinkage. And the problem is we, you know, maybe we should have gone a little bit further out. Maybe we should have done some map estimation. But we could be a bit more aggressive about what we do here. The nice thing about map estimation and throwing variables away is that you don't have to collect them <laughs> when you go to use this uh, model in practice. And, you know, Annotating and incorporating all of that function, data, function data is, is time consuming. If you find out a variable is not worthwhile, there's not providing pr uh, predictive value at this level of the, the model, don't collect it, don't use it. So I, I think you know, map estimation is probably the way, way to go. And, and, and looking at that in this range and maybe uh, one or two further uh, more extreme versions of, of the, the NIG model. But it is amazing. I mean, it, it, this isn't the, the, for an ROC curve in a medical Journal, this is horrible, right? But you know, think about what we're doing here. We're, we're predicting whether a SNP is likely to be associated with some phenotype. We grouped all phenotypes together in the GWAS catalog. They're all different in most cases, or the large clusters of various different things: cancers, immune disorders, blah blah blah. And we're developing a model uh, that associates what, or that predicts whether a variant is likely associated with some phenotype or not, and predicting other variants also seem to be associated with it, and, and you do pretty well. You know, you, you really do pretty well. And that's, that's, um, that can help you. And I think that's the point here. And we, you know, I, I, what, you know, the models that we're building are fairly 
fairly straightforward. And as, with more detailed understanding and more detailed encode data, I think we can do better than that. Um, but you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. So, so here is an example from our multi-GWAS uh, study. Um, we looking at advanced stage serous ovarian cancer. We've got about 2,000 controls, about 3,200 cases. Uh, we have imputed data to the HADMAP 3 density with about 2.5 million SNPs in the analysis. And for the purposes of this analysis, we, we chose a, uh, that SNPs were independently, uh, had an independent prior probability of association of 1 in 100,000. Change that. But in terms of the rankings, what I'm looking at here later are rankings. Uh, that doesn't matter so much. Um, what we have are nine known published susceptibility loci that I can look at as, as, as true hits and see what happens to them and see, see how our uh, experimentation and, and uh, studies would have proceeded if we had used the function data versus what we did versus not to use the function data. So I'm comparing ranks and posterior probabilities of the, uh, these, these variants on when we use and when we don't use the function data. And I'm just using the plug, plug in estimate. So I took the, the NEG3 model that seemed to do the best. That gives me a, a point estimate of the, the beta coefficient, uh, the coefficients of the function data in that prior. I plug that in and, uh, and update the priors using the, the, this expression is several slides back. The rank using the genetic data only is here. It varies somewhere from 45,000 out of 2.5 million up to the highest rank SNP that turned out to be associated with about 21. Um, using the genetic data only. When you incorporated the functional data, all of them except for this one in red, uh, the rank moved up. So uh, eight out of nine uh, ended up being ranked higher than they would have, they were with only the, the data, and some substantially higher. To the point that if, if um, your budget was to follow up the top 5,000 variants, uh, using the genetic data, you would, have only, you would have missed four of the nine, genetic data only. And that, you would have missed only one of the nine using the function data. So a little bit of extra statistics and data collection would have given you a higher yield at that first stage. With, uh, if, you're, if you had the budget to follow up 10,000, you'd have missed two out of nine with G only and, and none of them with the, the adding the function data. And you know, this is, I think this is pretty good given all of the flaws and holes that, in, in, in what we're doing here. And this is all sort of broad stroke uh, analysis. The, you know, Given the, the scale of measurement here, there, there are um, there's a, a, lot, a lot of information we're missing, and there's, um, and, and there's room, certainly room for improvement, yet we're still doing pretty well. So I'm going to skip that. We're at 3 o'clock right now. So um, I, I think you know, the point is that they, they, the, these functional signatures, incorporating functional data a priori, it makes sense. It can lead to more efficient study designs and, and, and quicker uh, get, getting getting to the, to the um, you know, the, the meat of, the, of the, the genome more quickly for a particular a phenotype, but there's work to do. And, and there, you know, one of the issues is, is depth. Uh, when, we, when we did all of these analyses, we were imputing to 2.5 million SNPs and annotating 2.5 million SNPs in both the genetic analysis and in the training analysis where we were building the prior distribution. <laughs> but there's a lot more out there, and the, uh, you know, the efficacy of this is going to depend upon you having as complete a coverage as possible in a particular region because you don't want to miss the functionally relevant SNP uh, at any of these stages of analysis. So now we've got the Thousand Genomes project and data from that to give us a pretty comprehensive view of genetic variation. If we redo our analyses at that scale, we'll have the depth and coverage that will, I assume, only improve uh, the ability of these basic methods. The next step, of course, is to you know take into account the cell-specific patterns that we see in the new ENCODE data, and there's gobs of ENCODE data, and we're going to have to adapt our models for that, but I think it's probably, given what we see here, worth the effort to, to do both of those things. That's where I'll leave it. Thank you.